Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today we're talking about when sentences come with baggage. But first, we have new merchandise for you. Woo, new match. By very popular demand, we have scarves that have tree structure diagrams on them. They're very subtle. There are no words. There are no labels. So they can belong to whatever theoretical framework you're interested in, whether that's syntax trees, language family trees, syllable structure trees. Uh, they look really cool. We're really excited to see them around your necks. We have them in grey, cream, light pink, teal and red. And we've also taken the opportunity to add a few more colours that were requested to the IPA scarf lineup as well. So if you were thinking of getting an IPA scarf or one of our new tree scarves, we have some new colours. We also have new colours for um, some of the not judging your grammar, just analysing it, um, zip bags and notebooks. And we also have a bunch of new items that say, heck yeah, descriptivism, or heck yeah, language change, because we couldn't pick. So if you want to be extra excited about linguistic descriptivism or language change, you can now do that. And if you want a black or a gray IPA scarf with all your favorite characters from the International Phonetic Alphabet on them, you can get those too. And as always, if some of those colours don't take your fancy, all of our patrons can order custom colour merch in whatever colours they like. Just go to lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I am really excited about this topic because this gets to take me back five years to when I was obsessed with watching a YouTube series called The Lizzie Bennet Diaries. And I watched it entirely on your recommendation. And it was good, right? And and just for the sake of it, not because I wanted to be ready for our presupposition topic. (laughs) No, I I think you just... I think I actually got our producer Claire into it before and then she got you into it. Yeah. Um, So The Lizzie Bennet Diaries is not about linguistics. It's a YouTube adaptation of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice set in the modern day and... It has very little to do with linguistics, in fact, except for the fact that one of its episodes, episode 63, has this really good example of exactly what we're talking about in this episode. And I feel like watching this episode five years ago when I was still in grad school, I had this moment when I was like, this is exactly what I have been learning about presuppositions for. So I want to act this out for you. Okay. Should we act it out together? Yeah, but I need to give a little bit of context first. So okay. if you know anything about the story of Pride and Prejudice, you know, spoiler alert, there's... <laughs> Sorry, the book's really old, like... You've only had 200 years to read it, folks. <laughs> you know, uh, so the storyline where we are up until this point is Darcy has done the first, like, really awkward proposal to Lizzie, and she has said, no, who are you kidding? And... Then he has given her a letter where he, like, explains himself. And because this is a YouTube vlog series, all of this has happened as if in the vlogs. And at this moment, Lizzie has read the letter, but she hasn't talked about it on the vlogs, because if you'll recall from the book, it has very, you know, kind of private and personal information about other people in the letter, so she doesn't feel like she can talk about it. And so at this moment, Carolyn, who is Bingley's sister, who is also probably has a thing for Darcy, has come over to Lizzie's videos and been like, hey, Lizzie, so, like, what's up? (laughs) And this is where our scene starts. Uh, Do you want to be Lizzie or Carolyn? I'm happy to be Carolyn. Okay. It's all good. Like, I'm not going to deny you the opportunity to be Lizzie in a rerun through of the Lizzie Bennet diet. (laughs) I appreciate you. You're a good friend. (laughs) I'm not a monster. (laughs) Uh, Carolyn is also a great character. She causes all these, like, really interesting, uh, you know, semantic moments in the the story. (laughs) I'm really happy to play the semantically integral character. Okay, okay. All right. So Lizzie says, you have been watching my videos. No, I haven't. That's why I need you to catch me up. You've been watching my videos and now you want to know what's in Darcy's letter. No, I don't. I believe an appropriate response would have been, what letter? Oh, busted. That's Lauren being scandalized, not Caroline being busted. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, okay. So cut, cut scene. We're back as ourselves. (laughs) So what happens here after the end of this scene, Lauren, what do you think about Carolyn's like video having watched state? Well, she's clearly busted, as as I have declared, because 
the response should have been what letter there's this assumption that she knows about the letter because she's not like ah take a step back what are you talking about but she denied it she said no but she said no i don't know what's happening not no to the earlier bit of information that is in the sentence yeah like no i don't want to know what's in the letter yeah. oh wait i'm still in, like presupposing that there's a letter yeah so the letter is just like in there as baggage yeah the letter gets gets brought along for the ride yeah and so this was really interesting to me because it's this very clear example from the situational context. And of course, Lizzie's not a linguist, but she's saying, I recognize that there was this extra meaning that I was bringing along that you shouldn't have been aware of. Lizzie is a natural linguist. <laughs> she's a natural linguist. And it's a similar type of thing that can happen. The classic example of this nature is if I were to say to you, hey, Lauren, is the present king of France bald? Oh, OK. Let me think. Um... <laughs> Let me think about who the current <laughs> king of... Hey, wait a minute. What just happened? <laughs> this is a trick question. Like, whether they're bald or not is not the relevant fact. The relevant fact is that there hasn't been a king of France since the revolution in, like, 1780. Oh, jeez, my history teacher is going to be very upset with me. I, I, that's probably right. I don't know. I'll, I'll check that. <laughs> this isn't very good masterpiece theater. Yeah, so the problem with that is, again, it presupposes that there is a present king of France um, in the way that if I said, is the present queen of England bald, you know, you have a real answer to that question. Oh, no, I think. <laughs> it looks like her hair, but how do we know? But I feel like I'm definitely on firmer ground with that than asking about kings of France. This is a famous example because Bertrand Russell, who was a philosopher, um, kind of it was one of his favorite sentences. He loved bringing this one out as like a dinner party conversation piece to get people talking about like how sentences come with all this additional information and we kind of presume a whole bunch of knowledge and put it at the front. That sounds like a great dinner party topic of conversation. I'm going to do that now. Yeah. I teach undergraduate semantics on the theory that what you're doing is teaching people how to have really great anecdotes for parties. I'm into it. So this is a famous one. It comes up when we're teaching this kind of thing, it, but it, it kind of comes from the philosophical tradition of understanding how meaning works. And it amuses me because a lot of philosophers don't realise that a bunch of the time what they're doing is actually linguistics when they're doing kind of this language theory stuff. And uh, it really just makes me happy that there are all these philosophers think they're doing philosophy. And it's like, you're all actually linguists. You just don't know it. <laughs> Everything is linguistics. I, I think my favorite thing about presuppositions, well, one of my many favorite things, in addition to the many jokes that rely on it, which we're definitely going to get into, um, one of my favorite things is that one of the ways to spot a presupposition is the response that you need to have to a sentence that has a buried presupposition. So if you reply, you know, do you want to know what's in Darcy's letter? And you say, yes, I do that presupposes that Darcy wrote a letter. And if you say, no, I don't, that still presupposes that Darcy wrote a letter. So if you want to not be Carolyn and not get stuck, you have to say, what letter? Or actually, I didn't know there was a letter. Or, hey, wait a minute, there was a letter? And the hey, wait a minute one gets abbreviated HWAM. H-W-A-M. It's an acronym. Okay. Um, and so it's the HWAM test. You're like... H-wham, there isn't any king of France. H-wham, Darcy wrote a letter? Yeah, you need a little H-wham stamp to, like, stamp on examples. Yeah! Declare them as, like, presuppositionably cancelable. A little stamp you can stamp on someone's forehead when they make an unwarranted presupposition. H-wham! H-wham. You could tattoo it on your knuckles. It's got the right number of letters. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stick with a rubber stamp. <laughs> Personally. Anyway, it also just sounds like a superhero move. H-wham. Or H-O-M, there isn't any king of France. There you go. Yeah. So this is a way of cancelling the presupposition. So the idea that Darcy wrote a letter is a presupposition. The idea there is a king of France is a presupposition. Instead of putting on h -wham knuckle dusters, maybe we can put on some lab coats, Gretchen. <laughs> okay, we can put our linguist lab coats on. some more presupposition testing. Because this is one of those great areas of linguistics where you can kind of prod at examples and see how they react and see whether you can cancel them. So, hey, wait a minute is a good... If you have a hey, wait a minute reaction, that's a good uh, indication that there is some kind of presupposition. Okay. Do you have an example for us? Well, we had the H-wham. Okay. Another thing to do is to find a way that cancels it by bringing in additional information. Okay. 
So the present king of France is bald could be cancelled by saying the present king of France is bald and also not recognised as a monarch because of the revolution. Oh, so there's some pretender or some descendant that has set up a puppet court and claims to be the king of France. Yeah. Hmm. One of my favourite presupposition cancellings is a really cheeky one because it's something that is so... We don't even think of it as a presupposition because it's so semantically wiped for us. But when we say good morning, we oh. say good morning and someone goes, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> True. Is my, is my favourite presupposition cancelling because, you know, you that's the way you greet people. You just say good morning. And it's more of a like... I wish you a good morning rather than you are having a good morning. But, you know, if someone says good morning and you reply with, actually, my boss was late and the coffee shop had run out of muffins, you're cancelling their presupposition of goodness in the morning. (laughs) I like it. A slightly fancier test, but one that I think shows how complicated our presupposed knowledge is, is something that's called projecting in the literature, which is where really complicated sentences or more complicated sentences can lead to really interesting presupposition carrying or cancelling. And I'll give you two example sentences to kind of think about and then we'll we'll talk through them. Lizzie Bennet themed. So Lizzie thinks that Darcy's brother is delightful versus Lizzie said that Darcy's brother is delightful. And so... I think to the first one, I have to go, hey, wait a minute. I didn't know that Darcy had a brother. Yeah. But if Lizzie thinks that Darcy's brother is delightful. Maybe she just thinks Bingley's actually his brother or something. Maybe. Like, you can construct a reality in which you presuppose that Li- that Darcy has a brother. But if I mm-hmm. said Lizzie said that Darcy's brother is delightful. Yeah. Then, you know, it doesn't matter if it's true or if I think it's not true, that I'm, I'm not bothered by it because I'm just like, well, now she's asserting that. Yeah. So because Lizzie said it, you go, hey, wait a minute. Why would she say he has a brother? I didn't think he did. She's saying it as some kind of like joke or to throw me off track because it's what she says. But if if you report what she thinks, you're more likely to agree that the presupposition holds and that Darcy has a brother or that you're misunderstanding something. Hmm. But if you have like Lizzie knows that Darcy's brother is delightful. I think what happens is that people just run this with all permutations of possible thinking, knowing, believing. Yeah, because I think if I say Lizzie knows that Darcy's brother is delightful, that implies that I, the speaker who's saying the sentence. Yeah. Now, I also think that Darcy has a brother and that this brother is delightful. Hey, wait a minute. Darcy doesn't have a brother. (laughs) When Um, you first um, wrote these examples, I went in and changed them because I was like, it has to be Darcy's sister because he doesn't have a brother. Yeah, I can't believe he didn't trust me. (laughs) (laughs) And then I was like, wait, wait, no, this is what you're trying to do. This is the point of the example. <laughs> this is the point of these examples. I feel sorry for people who don't know anything about Lizzie Bennet Diaries or Pride and Prejudice or Pride and Prejudice and Zombies or Pride and Prejudice BBC or Pride and Prejudice the film because they're like, yeah, Darcy might have a brother, whatever. Whatever, who cares? Yeah, uh, if you don't know, I mean, the Lizzie Bennet Diaries is free. You can watch it on YouTube. It'll take many hours. <laughs> okay, so that's some ways that we can kind of pick apart presuppositions and we can see that they're quite complicated and slippery and it's not always as easy immediately as like whoa what king of france yeah and they require a certain amount of world knowledge as well yeah because oftentimes we accommodate a presupposition without even really thinking about it like the king of france one gets us because that's part of world knowledge that there isn't a king of france yeah but i'm sure if i said to some people you know the president of canada is bald people might be like oh okay wait a second canada has a prime minister (laughs) Oh, uh, yeah, I didn't even pay attention to that. Yeah, we know a certain amount of whether France is a is a monarchy because that was a the French Revolution was a pretty big deal. But it was a pretty big deal. In more subtle cases of world knowledge, you don't necessarily pick that kind of thing up. Yeah. Do you know what's really upsetting to me? What's that? Is that the is the present King of France bald? Wouldn't have worked in the time that Pride and Prejudice was written because it was written like a decade after the monarchy collapsed. Oh no! You know, then you have to say like, is the present King of France headless? <laughs> it's it's true like the day it's after the king of france napoleon no <laughs> only recently um because i was like it would have been so great if we could have had like is the present king of france bald completely collapses now at the time of elizabeth and darcy totally would have held but alas no ah so it was still 
it was still uh, had this weird presupposition for them. We haven't had a present king of France for quite a while. But it's not just so. A lot of the examples we've been using so far have been with names of people and names of roles that people have, um, which is something that you can that you can presuppose. Yeah. But you can also do it with other kinds of words, not just names. Uh, one example that I really like is somebody on Tumblr quite a while back, because I was looking through my presuppositions tag, asked me if I could recommend my favorite etymological dictionary. Lauren, what's your favorite etymological dictionary? My favorite etymological... <laughs> this is like such a linguist question, isn't it? My favorite etymological dictionary. Um, a dictionary that is just etymologies? I mean, obviously, etym online. But is it your favorite? I mean, I said obviously because it's like the only one. I mean, I, I guess the Oxford English Dictionary does some etymology and some of the other ones. They do, do some bit. etymologies, but it's often behind a paywall. Yeah. Yeah. So when I replied to this at the time, I was like, well, I don't have a favorite. I just have one. <laughs> it's etym online. You should go read it. It's really nice to not have to make choices in life. You know, there's there's one that's online that's good that you should check, you know. Or I think maybe they asked some of your favorite etymological dictionaries, and I was like, there's there's just this one. This was a joke that I used to play with my siblings. They'd be like, you're my favorite brother. You're my favorite sister. <laughs> when I was growing up, I only have one of each. Yeah, it is a good, it's like a, a top Mother's Day card to my favorite mother. Yeah, uh, if you actually have two mothers for some reason, it's, that's really mean, but... Yeah, true. When you only have the one, it's 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 just clever. Your your birth mother is sitting there crying while your stepmom is like really smug. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't don't actually do this if you have multiple mothers. <laughs> don't do this if you have more than one mother. But if you're conveniently single mothered as I am, convenient for the sake of this joke. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. So you can pull the favorite X. What's your favorite theory about how language determines thought? <laughs> <laughs> It's my, it's my least favorite theory. <laughs> kind of backs you into a corner there. You know, if you're like the only person in a race, it's like you came first in the marathon that I had in my backyard 10 minutes ago that no one else ran in. Yeah. But you came first. Good job. It's a good way to, good way to talk yourself up. Yeah. I'm my favorite person in my apartment right now. Yeah. <laughs> Motivational self-talk for presuppositions. Aww. There are other ways in which presuppositions are really just an excuse to talk about great strategies for irritating siblings. <laughs> um, and one set of those is including the use of stop. Mm. So uh, the classic stop hitting yourself <laughs> um, presupposes that you chose to start hitting So this yourself. is the classic thing where you, where you go to your, your sibling and you like make their own hand hit them? You pick up someone else's hand and use it to hit them. Which, like, makes... But I'm really glad that you also agree that this is a thing that... Oh, oh yeah, very, very much. So like, like, I don't want to sound like the person that's subjective. Like. <laughs> I mean, I, obviously, personally, never did this. Mm, yes. It was your favourite younger brother who would do it all the time. <laughs> I have witnessed this, this happening among hypothetical siblings that may or may not be mine. <laughs> or, or even stop hitting yourself. Or you can do, like, stop, stop hitting me. And be like... You know, and then you try to bring the wrath of your parents down on the sibling, uh, even if they, they weren't actually hitting you. Or what, like one that I get asked all the time, which is like, when did you stop eating meat as a vegetarian? It's a, a topic that I don't give much thought to, but other people are really interested in. Right. And some people, like, so if you've been vegetarian in your entire life, then it's like, well, I didn't stop because I didn't start. Yeah. It Have you? It presupposes. See, there you go. You're really interested now, aren't you? I don't in know. how long I've been vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> or the other kind of classic example of ones that assume a emotional valence towards a situation. So if you have something yeah. like, how are you coping with your thesis? Ugh. You're like, actually, I'm enjoying it. Or actually, it's it's been going pretty well these days. Uh, I finished mine like five years ago and I still get an <laughs> automatic like twinge just hearing you ask that question. But yeah, there were times where, like, I thought you actually... said you, you finished your, you're going to say you finished yours five years ago and people still ask you that question. <laughs> No, they um like people would ask you and some some months you'd be like you'd be having a really good month things were under control and you'd be like well I'm, I'm coping fine like it's all good but you can't ever ask this question like you neutrally or positively you have to presuppose that things aren't optimal because it's a stressful experience I get asked this question about my hair because I have very curly hair and people say, you know, how do you deal with your hair? How do you manage yeah. your hair? And I'm yeah. like, excuse me. <laughs> I like my hair. I resent that it has to be a thing to be dealt how with. How do you deal with the burden of your hair? <laughs> like, how do you keep yourself yeah. from murdering your hair? Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so uh, I think we've declared those as the annoying younger sibling paradigm of questions. I think this fits very well with our overall Pride and Prejudice theme that has appeared for this episode. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. There are definitely some younger siblings in Pride and Prejudice. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and say some annoying younger siblings in Pride and Prejudice. I think I think that could be said. Yeah. So that's the kind of that set of that class of words. And there's also a set around kind of the number of times you've been doing something. So if you say, you know, if, if someone else is going up and, you know, going to the kitchen, they're like, I'll have some water too. It's like, excuse me, I wasn't, I wasn't planning yeah. on bringing you water. Oh, I'd, I'd love some of those biscuits if you're opening the packet. It's like, I wasn't, I wasn't opening that. Or since you're better at mowing the lawn, I'll just let you do it. <laughs> yeah presupposes that you're better at mowing the lawn. Or just because I'm smarter than you doesn't mean that you can do... <laughs> <laughs> that one you have to blame your siblings all the time. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, you're contractually obligated. Yeah. So I guess they also fit in with annoying younger sibling theme. I mean, older siblings, I, I feel like I should admit, as an older sibling, can also presumably be annoying. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other one that I that I really like is our questions, like, why is Darcy such a jerk? I love that it's just like, there's no question that he is a jerk, because we're getting straight to understanding the reason for it. Yeah, or like, at the end of the book, spoiler alert, when Lizzie finally gets engaged to Darcy, why? and she's like, why did, you get en- <laughs> why did you get engaged to Darcy when he's such a jerk? Yeah. Like, why, why would you want to get engaged to such a jerk? Presupposes that he's still acting in his, like, jerky behavior from the beginning of the book. Yeah. I think of, like, why questions as, like, if presupposition is about bringing baggage in, then using, like, a why question is about bringing, like, really space-efficient baggage. Like, you just fit so much baggage in so efficiently with a question presupposition. I think the most epic example of that that I found when I was researching this was a study from... Uh, you know, one of those like psychology today kind of journals, you know, pop science things. And the question that they had in their headline was, why do people want to eat babies? Now, you messaged this to me <laughs> with no context. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I really did not know how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I feel like I need it's to clear funny. up for the record that I do not want to eat babies. It's funny in retrospect now that I know that you were sending it to me for the episode. But why Why do people write headlines like, why do people want to eat babies? I, I mean, it got yeah. our attention. Yeah. Unfortunately, I tried to click on the study and the link was from ages ago and it doesn't work anymore. Oh no, so we'll never know. We'll never so we'll know. never know. I think this refers to, you know when you have a baby... People do say this, like, oh, I just want to, like, om nom nom it all the way up. And they kind of, like, like nibble on it, but not with your teeth. <laughs> I've seen people oh, do this right. with babies. Yeah, okay. But not in, like, a consuming eat sort of way, just in a, like, making the mouth movements at sort of way. Yeah. I hope this is the case, because I don't want to discover some sort of, like, weird thing <laughs> that apparently is so well known you can put it in a headline. <laughs> So this, the examples we've been giving might give you the impression that there's just like a specific set of words that we use to construct presuppositions. And that's, that's true. We have a Wikipedia article that has a list of words that trigger presupposition in this way. But it's not just specific words. It's also words in particular contexts. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite, and my favorite, I mean, least favorite examples of this is when certain parents, <coughs> disproportionately male parents, get referred to as babysitting when they're taking care of their own children. Ah, uh, this happened when, and I'm not going to link to any of them because I refuse to do any of them dignity, but there was a massive furor because when Serena Williams went back to playing tennis, her husband sat by the court looking after their child while she did her job. And mm-hmm. everyone was like, oh, it's so cute. He's babysitting while she goes back. It's like, he's, he's not babysitting. It's his own freaking kid. Yeah. For me, babysitting presupposes that you're looking after someone else's child, usually for some kind of, like, financial gain. Yeah, exactly. And if it's your own child, like, hopefully your your partner isn't paying you to look after your own child. That would be... That would be your own personal arrangement. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but generally, it's the case that people are taking care of their own children as co-parents and, you know, they get referred to as babysitting. Yeah. So in this case, it's 
this word babysitting, but used in a particular context, presupposes something that doesn't quite gel yeah. with it. The other example that we encounter a lot for this is when um, you know certain varieties of English or varieties of particular language get referred to as having an accent or losing an accent or accented or accentless which presupposes that there is some variety of English that isn't an accent. Everything's an accent. It's all, yeah. you know, there isn't, there isn't one neutral version of English that, you know, is the, the, the zero centre. Even though our default assumption is that we're the ones that don't have an accent. And, you know, Gretchen, you have an accent, but I don't. No, no, I, I don't, I'm the one that doesn't have an accent. You have an accent. Oh, what a... <laughs> What a pickle we put ourselves in. <laughs> I, I really enjoy describing, uh, a, a, a partly because, you know, you can sometimes do this to play with people's expectations. Like if you're talking, you're talking to somebody and you can tell that they think of themselves as, you know, oh, I've got this very standard like American accent or British accent to be like, no, 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 you're, you're the accented one. Canadian English is just the normal one. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Kind of flip their presupposition back on them. Yeah, but at the same time, like I know that the accent that I have within Canadian English is considered "quote unquote" less accented than other varieties, so I don't want to do that when it's not flipping the script. <laughs> um, we found some more great examples in the wild of presuppositions, but I, I'll let you decide which one you want to share first. So the way that I found these, is I did a search on Twitter uh, for presupposition, and I filtered it by only people that I follow, and I went back like eight years <laughs> to all these linguists that didn't know that their tweets from like 2011 uh, <laughs> were going to be used as... Where they were like, huh, look at this yeah. example of a presupposition, because it turns out I haven't blogged about this very much. <laughs> so thank you to linguists of Twitter. Thank you to linguists of Twitter. Thanks to uh, Lynn Murphy, who tweeted uh, not so long ago um, an example which went, which Americanisms make you wince? And this is from a British newspaper, which presupposes that some Americans Americanisms make you wince, or that, like, certain, you know, that similar examples like what are your linguistic pet peeves or which words should be banished presupposes that some words should be banished and that people have linguistic pet peeves when this is, you know, this is also something that is not necessary and is not something that should be presupposed. Emily Bender on Twitter um, shared a quote and then kind of deconstructed the presupposition in it. The quote was, given that ours is a scientific discipline, you must be careful to ground your argument in previous research. And Emily Bender's like, well, do they imagine that the disciplines outside the sciences don't ground their research in previous work? That, like, anything that's not a hard science just, like, Ooh. fabricates things anew every time without any reference to what goes ahead? Time doesn't exist except for sci in science. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> The only area that has that has time is science. You know, humanities and social sciences just exist in this non-time bound sphere. <laughs> um, I, f I feel like it's a good time to send people back to the episode about existing in time as a human. That's true. We did a we did a solstice episode about existing in time. Um, I, possibly one of my favorite examples, which comes from a from a non linguist, saying, "As his name is not biggest bird." We are to understand that Sesame Street is home to at least one, perhaps more, truly immense unseen birds. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like so much of our discussion so far has been like, wow, look at all this extra baggage you get and you don't realise it. I feel like this person is just trying to shove more baggage in than is possible. <laughs> this is the equivalent of like sitting in your suitcase trying to jam it close. Yeah. How much more presupposition can I try and pretend is in this name? I mean, I think there's a there's a genuine example beyond the facetious example where if you say something is bigger, it's implying that it's also not the biggest. So, like, something's bigger than Texas doesn't presuppose that there could be something that is even bigger again. Yeah, so it's a stretch, but it's a funny stretch. Yeah. Or a more mundane example from Sherry Young Chen on Twitter, which she posted a photo of Welcome Back on the sign of a neighbourhood pub, which was clearly trying to presuppose that you had already been there, you know, so that they could welcome you back as a, like, we're part of the neighborhood sort of thing. And it's a good, like, I think it's worth taking, like, we've been giving some very constructed examples. And I think the reason that people keep coming back to the present King of France example, etc., is that they're very clean and clinical and easy to dissect what's happening. But the reality is, like, we use presupposition to get through conversation every day of our lives. Like, Absolutely. If, you know, if we're talking about Emily Bender, 
you presuppose that that is the Emily Bender that we both know or that will be locatable in the show notes of the show. And if I had to say every time, you know, Emily Bender, who's a computational linguist who you may know from Twitter, like that's just going to get a very tedious conversation. Like a person that I know who is a person. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Who's alive. And like if I had to stop you every time and be like, whoa, you have our sister? Like that's going to get tedious. Yeah, normally we're pretty seamless about this, especially like introducing random family members or introducing, you know, if I say like, oh, I can't chat with you right now. I've got to go pick up my dog from the vet. You know, you you, you can accept that even if you don't know that I have a dog. I don't have a dog. But this is the, <laughs> this is the example. I was like, you have a dog? <laughs> this is news to me, Gretchen. <laughs> You've been to my place. You've seen I don't have a dog. But, yeah, but presupposition works in a way that it's like conversation is busy the fact that I have a dog is not the important thing. It's the fact that I can't talk to you right now that's the important thing. So let's just go with it. Yeah, you just kind of quietly update your mental ledger for, you know, which which bits of baggage you're being hung on to. Yeah. Um, a really interesting example of this comes from a language log post from a couple of years ago by Julie Sedevi, and she talks about boasting through presuppositions. Hmm. And she gives the example of a politician who was trying to find a way to integrate into his conversation, like, look, I've created 7 million jobs, yeah. without saying, I've created 7 million jobs and you all need to know about it. Yeah. And eventually, what the advisors came to was to, to do that both through presuppositions. So saying something like, the 7 million jobs we've created won't be much use if we can't find education people to fill them. That's why I want to create a tax deduction for college tuition to help kids go to college to take those jobs. Yeah. And so you get the, the 7 million jobs in there that we've created, but you don't have to say, we've created 7 million jobs. You should definitely believe us when we say this. <laughs> and it gives it like... Um, solidity because you're not jamming it in as new information. You're treating it. And the sneaky thing about presuppositions is that they're in that part of the sentence that we treat as old information or existing information. Yeah, exactly. So in the comments on that post, uh, there's a woman saying that she's found this to be really effective for introducing people to the idea that she's a lesbian because she just says, you know, my wife, oh, my wife would kill me if I watched that new episode of Torchwood without her. Have you seen it? And then people just have to add the my wife to the background information, and it, she finds it's like less less confrontational, makes for an easier conversation than saying, I have a wife. How do you feel about that? Yeah, very handy. Yeah, so presuppositions can communicate things about social norms as well. And one really interesting example of how we seamlessly update our information via presuppositions comes from forensic linguistics, actually. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So this is when you use linguistics in a courtroom to determine how people can give evidence and be asked questions and all sorts of things. And in this particular example, um, so it's a study by a memory scientist called Elizabeth Loftus. They showed people videos of car crashes, and then they'd ask them questions about what they'd seen. Sometimes they'd ask them questions in two stages, or they'd ask them certain questions that had presuppositions in them. So if they asked them, do you remember seeing the stop sign, people would be like, yeah, or sure, like maybe they'd answer yes at a higher rate than people who are asked, do you remember seeing a stop sign, which is not a presupposition. Right. There is an updated version of the study that was recently done in French by a linguist who I know named Elizabeth Allen Smith at the University of Quebec at Montreal. And so she made a video and played it for Montrealers, which again, you know, showed a robbery. So she had them fill out a questionnaire Um, The first questionnaire was things like, did you see a trash can or the yellow trash can or the green trash can? And the trash can was actually yellow. And then a week later, she'd have them come in and say, what color was the trash can? And they could select green or yellow. Uh And so in the cases where... So sometimes they got no extra presupposition information. Sometimes they got the correct presupposition information. And sometimes they got incorrect presupposition information. And she found that people would give the incorrect answer... You know, they'd say it was green when it was actually yellow when they'd had this type of presupposition, but they did so at slightly different rates than the English speakers did in the same studies. Huh. So they were less likely to be in- influenced when you added true information, but they were more likely to be influenced when you added false information right. than, the, than the English speakers. And of course, there's a bunch of stuff that could lead to this. And I think, you know, she's planning follow-up studies to figure out exactly which factors affected this. It might might have been French or English, might have been other differences in the the paradigm of the study. Yeah. But to think about, like, some of this can even differ cross-linguistically, how much you update 
the information that you think uh, is in the world based on a presupposition. Which has, like, massive implications for how people are cross-examined in court, right? Like, if you squeeze Absolutely. a whole bunch of presuppositions into questions, you could potentially confuse people's ideas of what happened. Well, and if you, you know, if you feed someone false information and presuppositions and they agree to it and then they give false answers later and you can prove that they gave false answers, you can use that to discredit a witness. Mm, that's mean. Who maybe was just doing what we do in conversation all the time. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to Lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get scarves with the International Phonetic Alphabet or tree diagrams on them, and other Lingthusiasm merch at Lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistics questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Current bonus topics include memes and poetry, the semantics of sandwiches, and conlangs. And you could help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. If you can't afford to pledge, that is okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can rate us on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our audio producer is Claire, our editorial producer is Emily, and our production assistant is Celine. And our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! <laughs>